Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 133, Tyle Hertzens and Steve Guttenberg debate the relative merits of subjective listening versus objective measurements. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded October 22nd, 2012, episode 133 The Great Audio Debate. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek. This week, my guest geeks are Tyle Hertzens, the editor-in-chief of innerfidelity.com. Hey, Tyle, welcome back to the show. Hi, Scott. Good to see you. You too. And Steve Guttenberg, uh, a freelance writer and the author of the Audiophiliac blog on CNET. Steve, welcome back to the show for you. How you doing, Scott? Doing good. Thanks. Uh, those who are logged into the, to, uh, the chat room at irc.twit.tv or watching live at live.twit.tv can post questions for us as we continue our discussion of... The merits of objective measurements versus subjective listening. And we're going to have a little debate here today, which should be at least as interesting, if not more so, than the debate later tonight between the presidential candidates, <laughs> uh, which I, I, I started watching those debates and I kind of fell away. I'm going, ugh, it's just, ugh. Anyway, we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about something even more interesting than foreign policy, which is uh, the Difference and the relative merits of objective measurements versus subjective listening. Before we do, though, I do want to take a couple of minutes, because I know both you guys were at the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest last weekend, mm -hmm. weekend before last, and we had a whole show on that last week with, with some guys who were there, and it was great, but we didn't talk at all about headphones. And I know that one of the features of the show was uh, an event called can jam which was apparently some sort of uh, <laughs> situation where you could sit down and, and listen to a bunch of headphones and and do a direct comparison um so i, I would like to take a few minutes of, of that because i know that some people in the chat room are really interested in headphones at the show uh we'll start with you tile what uh what did you hear at the show that you really liked what was this can jam thing well, Can Jam um, <clears throat> uh, actually started with a series of events that were um, self-started by hobbyists on the uh, board headfi.org, head-fi.org. Uh, <clears throat> and Jude Mancilla, the guy who runs the board, um, decided that it would be a good idea to uh, have a show uh, that – uh, featured headphones and uh, basically what they did was they sort of started a satellite show it, it is um, sanctioned and directly connected to the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest it's in a, a large room uh, off to the side of the event uh, venue and um, basically it's 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 just a trade show that you know there's a a lot of 10 by 10 booths and 10 by 20 booths um, and it's mostly populated by uh, manufacturers of headphones and things like that. So it uh, was sort of a spin-off of uh, uh, self-created uh, shows, and then it, it uh, Jude sort of made it official and turned it into a uh, an HeadFi and RMAF sanctioned event, and and now it's you know, probably the premier headphone show in the United States. Uh, as far uh, as what I. As far Sorry, as what ahead. I saw there, as far as what I saw there that was uh, really good, uh, one uh, that I'm wearing is the V-Moda M100s. These have been long anticipated, and uh, Val Colton, the president of V-Moda, uh, finally brought them out, and I like them. And no, they're not flat. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they sound good. They're not and flat. they sound good. And then. Uh, 
the other headphone that I like, well, two other headphones that I liked a lot was the Jerry Harvey JH13 that he now has what he calls Freak Phase. And what this is, is um, he's uh, created custom in-ear monitors that have a very uh, coherent and very time-aligned uh, uh, response. So all the signals from all three drivers get to the ear uh, within 100 microseconds of each other. Um, so that is measured, and they did sound very good. And then the last one, uh, Steve Gutenberg actually wrote about for Inner Fidelity, which is the um, Ultimate Ears Personal Reference Monitor. This is an in-ear monitor that uh, you sit down in front of a box and adjust the crossovers uh, to custom suit your own hearing. And in that case, I sat there and made me adjustments. I have some very specific test tracks that I use when I do my listen, subjective listening tests. And it was surprisingly easy um, for me to adjust it to my liking. And uh, I adjusted it to my liking, and it was not flat. So there you go. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. Well, thank you for uh, <laughs> making my case. Exactly. <laughs> We well, we're going to get now. into that. We're going to get into that in a minute. But Steve, first of all, uh, what was your impression of of the headphones there? Which did you like the best? Uh, what was your impression of the whole can jam process? Which, as I understand it, was you, you sat down in front of a headphone amp that had five or six headphones, and you could switch between them, and then you go to another booth, and there are the same right. five or six headphones with a different no, amp, no. or each manufacturer each. No. Booth had their own uh, display and their own thing. And I actually, I use my uh, iPod Classic as a source, so I could always hmm. use my own music and listen to my own thing with their amplifier or headphones, or I plug their headphones directly into my iPod. So, okay, you know, what do you, you think that, was good? Well, actually, I agree that you know this this headphone that I have and I reviewed for Tile. The uh, it's called the Ultimate Ears Personal Reference Monitor. Uh, they actually had a display there that, like Tile did, you could dial in your own personal frequency response preferences. And so again, it's it's far from flat, and in my opinion, certainly better than flat. And the thing that's interesting about this this whole experience of people buying this type of headphones, which you could only do in like four cities in the United States: New York, L.A., Austin, and uh, some and Nashville, uh, is that you actually have to listen to them to do this. And that's one of the great things about going to CanJam is you can hear them and compare them there, which in, is pretty much impossible in any place but a CanJam. But in this mm. case, anybody who buys this this Ultimate Ears reference monitor will have to have heard them before they bought them, which makes them mm. sort of almost unique in headphone buying because that's one of the reasons why headphone reviewing is important because nowadays very few people get to hear the headphones they buy before they hear before they uh, they get to hear them before they buy them. Right, right, exactly. They count on my opinions and mm. Tile's opinions and measurements to make those decisions. <laughs> um, now, I want to I thank, have to by ask the way, you... Sorry, I want go to ahead, thank Steve. that I was uh, coached for this debate by uh, the ghosts and the spirits of Jay Gordon Holt and Christopher <laughs> Hitchens. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm ready. Very good. Very good. Okay. Before we get to the debate, I just want to have, ask you one question, Steve. Um, mm -hmm. On your iPad, on your iPod, which you used as your video, as your audio source, uh, uh -huh. how are the files encoded? Is it lossless? Uh, is it PCM? Apple loss. Is it Apple lossless? I'm sorry. Apple lossless. Apple lossless. Okay, so you you had the full range. You you weren't missing anything. So many people complain about MP3, uh, especially low bitrate MP3, as sounding pretty bad. So why you know I was that was my question. I was wanted, wanted to make sure you weren't doing that, which I uh, sort of would have assumed. God, God forbid. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the meat of the matter here, which is you guys have been back and forthing for a long time, and I've had you each on the show to, to present your side of the argument. And I have a feeling that you're not entirely opposed on every point, but we, I'd like to get into it here. Objective measurements, which Tile does on all the headphones that he uh, posts on Interfidelity, uh, versus purely subjective measurement, uh, listening, I should say, not subjective mm -hmm. measurements, although I suppose you could call it measurements, brain measurements in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, Steve, you, you tend to advocate more. So I absolutely do, yeah. 
Yeah. So, Steve, why don't you start uh, and tell us, uh, give us a summary of your position. Summary of my position is that, um, I, first of all, I'm not opposed to measurements for manufacturers and engineers designing equipment. I'm, uh, my, my case is against readers using measurements to decide which headphones they're going to buy. And, and my problem with that is, is, is actually pretty extensive because um, it leaves aside user preferences. It, you, it leaves aside what kind of amplifier you're plugging your headphones in. Are you listening out in the world where it's really noisy? Are you listening in a very quiet environment? What type of music are you listening to? What are your preferences for bass levels? Because that is wildly all over the place in terms of uh, what headphones sound like. There's, there are so many variables that coming up with a, you know, a so-called best headphone that doesn't address those personal preferences and how people listen to headphones, to me, is, is useless and unfortunately misleading because if the person, if the reader just buys the one that he thinks measures the best, and doesn't address his own personal preferences, he's probably not going to wind up with the best possible headphone. But how can a review reflect personal preferences of the, of the reader? Uh, because they're going to be different and all over the map. Because I'm, give, I'm, I'm telling the reader, I went on the subway and I listened in a noisy environment and it, it, they were uncomfortable. Oh, and comfort is also a very, an issue. I mean, these are all things that, that Tile touches on in his reviews. I'm, I'm just concerned that... A reader basing uh, a buying decision on measurements solely or weighting it heavily in the favor of measurements is possibly cheating themselves out of getting the best possible headphone for them. Not the best possible headphone in the abstract, the best headphone for that specific buyer. Uh, Tile, your response, and I'm not limiting you necessarily to two minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's important to note in, di in diametric opposition to Steve's viewpoint <laughs> that, it, that people should should not use measurements as their only methods to uh, <laughs> headphones and that they okay. should take their personal preference. No, that's what Steve said, isn't it? Oh, right. Yeah. Uh -oh. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right, as a matter of fact. So you, yeah. you can I, find common ground here. <laughs> I, 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 I think, I think the Scott, truth is, yeah. is that Steve and I – probably have a lot of common ground on this subject um, uh, where I think we're sort of left and right of center, but still tending towards the middle. Um, I do not advocate that people pick their headphones by looking at the measurements alone. Um, I think the measurements, the most the important value of the measurements is that they, they, a, they are actually measuring something. And I would say that a person's subjective review is not a measurement at all, but rather an expression of a person's experience. And an experience is, is not a measurement. It, they are two, they are things in completely different domains. And so, uh, uh what I think is that measurements provide, uh, additional information and provide information in a certain domain that, uh, can uh, at times explain why a headphone doesn't sound good or why a headphone um, has good bass response. And there's a variety of things that are, are quite obvious on headphone measurements that can be related to the things that we hear. So um, I think they're just another tool. Uh, I, I would say, though, that if you were to find four or five head headphones that had good measurements, what I would characterize as good measurements, that they would uh, sound markedly different uh, from what one's expectations might be. That, in, in other words, uh, the measurements do not, uh, they tell you that you're in the ballpark, but they do not tell you what the experience is like at all. So two headphones that are both good and both have very similar measurements can sound subjectively um I, I, I guess I should use the word substantially different. I mean, the, the experience is a very different thing. And so our experience is it really doesn't show itself uh, with any great um, uh, clarity in the measurements. It surprises me if, if it's true that two headphones that, that have similar measurements might in fact sound substantially different, to use your words. Uh, how can that be? 
Well, first of all, the measurements are uh, are unreliable to a reasonable degree. They they really are uh, measuring headphones is very very difficult, and there's a lot of factors that that can cause them to look similar in measurement but sound different when hearing them. Um, it's possible that you could. I, I wouldn't say they're. I say substantially different in the sense that as audiophiles, we are quite uh, interested in sound quality and will have a, a lot of sensitivity to a whole variety of factors, you know, imaging and dynamics and, and uh, you know, all sorts of things that really aren't going to readily show themselves in the measurements, although some of them do within reason, I think. Well, certainly measurements don't tell the entire story. I think we can all agree on that. Absolutely. Uh, Right, but but I have a question though. There's there is, sure. I mean, the people that are the readers, especially Tiles readers, who favor uh, objective measurements over subjective opinions, uh, seem to gloss over the fact that there's an interpretation of what those measurements mean. That there's basically, I'm saying, there's a subjective interpretation of this is good by Tile, and someone else could look at it and see and read that differently. Is that true, Tile? <laughs> Uh, no, I think there. I mean, it's an objective <laughs> measurement. It's it's an objective measurement, so that there are uh -huh. things that you can look at that are very clearly uh, um, that are fairly clear. Okay, um, I, I can give you. I'll, I'll, if you want, I give you an example. Please. Um, so here is a, a Sennheiser HD eight hundred impulse response measurement, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's got a, a nice clean. Uh, uh, a blip in the front, and then it there's a little bit of noise, but it 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 goes away quickly. It, it so damps out headphone. quite quickly, right? <clears throat> now that's a headphone that is known to image very well, and imaging one would think is one of those rather subtle things on headphones. And <clears throat> I think that imaging uh, the the ability to image well has largely to do with the, the with the transducer's ability to deliver clean edges, and as you can see, this headphone will likely deliver a clean leading edge. Now, as a uh, I'm going to show you, this is an Odyssey LCD three, and mm -hmm. there's substant substantially more noise on that measurement if, we, if you compare them next to each other. And it doesn't damp out nearly as quickly. And it doesn't damp out nearly as quickly. And one of the things that people readily say in terms of their subjective impressions of the difference between those two headphones is that the, the LCD3s don't image as well. And then to to show you, this is a Biodynamic T1. And in this Holy case... Holy smokes! You, there you yeah. There's a <laughs> dramatic amount of uh, extraneous... Noise. It's probably some sort of ringing after the fact. Um, and while they sound bright, they don't image as well, in my view, as as the HD 800. And then lastly, here's uh, a uh, Sennheiser HD 700, and you can see that it rings for a long time afterwards. Mm -hmm. And al so, although it has a fairly clean leading edge. It still has a ringing artifact in it. <clears throat> and um, I personally hear that. I can hear the, the extraneous energy around 6K or whatever it is that is on that headphone. So those are all things that are obvious in the objective measurement and um, with uh, careful interpretation. And, that, and I think that's Steve's point. It, it is difficult to interpret these things. Um, but with careful interpretation, it becomes fairly obvious. Now, Steve, do you would you agree that that there might be some correlation, some amount of correlation, between measurements such as uh, Tile has been showing us, and a perceived performance characteristic such as imaging? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for but, that. Good night. <laughs> but but you would know that before you measured it. It's not like the measurement told you something you didn't already know. Except so, if you're a reader and haven't heard the headphones. No, the, the words maybe, that I would write would say that, you know. That, ah, that's my okay. job is describing what the thing sounds like. Sure, And sure. also mentally comparing it or physically actually comparing it against other things that are similar to that design. Mm -hmm. 
So what you're you know. saying is that that as a reviewer, you would communicate mm -hmm. that from a uh, subjective, experiential point of view, uh, and you wouldn't need the measurements in order to support that right. conclusion. Right. I mean, there's a lot of guys on the internet now who measure headphones not as well and without the skill that the tile has. And and my question to them is do they really think that when they when they make these observations about a headphone sound that they are smarter they're they're catching the engineer at some major screw up that they did and and oversight in their design because backing track backtracking for a second I recently spoke to uh, an engineer from one of the major headphone companies who I can't quote because it was off the record. But what he said was, was that, no, though they do measure, they're a very measurement-oriented company, in the final analysis, they make a head, they're making decisions about what the headphones that are purely subjective. They want it to have a certain sound, even if it's an audiophile headphone. They are not engineers are not trying to make the most accurate sounding headphone. That is not part of their agenda from any headphone company that I'm aware of. That's not what they sit down and say, if we could only make this measure perfectly, we would have a perfect headphone. That's not a, de a design approach to how people make headphones. Hmm. So measuring them to see which ones are more perfect than others sort of sidesteps that, that observation. That's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to make a headphone that in their judgment sounds really good well it sounds like you guys are because that's perhaps, most people who buy the headphone will be doing they will be listening to it not measuring it so well a lot of people are listening than measuring so who should we please should we please the people who measure or should we please the people who are listening i guess that's <laughs> sort of how they made that that kind of decision well i want to uh, lawn dog in the chat room has asked a pertinent question here which is the usefulness of a flat response do you guys, for example, set your stereos to flat? I would guess probably not, but I'd like to hear from each of you on how important it is for, us, for headphones to have a flat, measured flat response. Ty, let's start with you. Uh, well, the, the problem is, is it's very, very, very difficult to know what flat is. And, and, and I'll give you a, a couple, I'll give you three examples rather quickly. Uh, I had a, a very interesting discussion with Paul Barton of PSB Speakers while I was at the uh, at the show, and um, he talked a lot about the uh, Canadian National Research Council and all the work that they've done with uh, correlating objective measurements with to subjective um, responses uh, by people. And they found out a couple things. One was that uh, people actually heard and had preferences that were closer to each other than they thought they would going in. So, so the the people's uh, desire for sound, if it's very uh, carefully looked for, tends to be closer than we think it it would be. Okay, um, but then in terms of headphones specifically, there's a there's a couple things that happen. First, in bass response, I think headphones, if, if as measured against what is thought of as flat, should have about four dB of extra bass response up to about. 100 hertz or so. So I think the bass needs to be elevated. But the reason for that is twofold. Uh, one is that um, when you're listening to speakers, you get bone conducted low frequency information. If people tap behind their ear on their skull, they're hear, they'll hear that it's quite loud. And so uh, if you're in a room with bass energy in it, you'll get bone conducted low frequency information, also chest compression, nasal cavity compression. So your perception of low frequency information doesn't just come through your ear canal. And so in headphones, it does just come through your ear canal. And as a consequence, uh, I, I believe that you don't have the experience of having enough bass if it's flat on the headphones. And a good example of this is the Edemotic ER4S, which is probably one of the flattest headphones in the world. And it, it almost universally, everybody says it doesn't have enough bass. Uh, Paul Barton also said that uh, people are used to listening to sound on speakers. Uh, speakers are used to mix audio and uh, in in rooms with speakers in them, you get reinforcement of the low frequencies due to the boundary effect of the walls. So you get extra low frequency gain there as well. And then on the high frequency side, uh, speakers in a room putting out a certain amount of high frequency energy 
uh, you're going to have less re uh, reflected high frequency energy than you do um, reflected mid and low and mid and low frequency energy, and therefore uh, on headphones uh, they tend to sound a little if they're flat, they tend to sound a little too bright. And the high frequencies, I believe, should be turned down something like 4 or 5 dB uh, above 3 kilohertz or so. But mm -hmm. um, so I don't – the problem is, is what do you mean by flat? If you take bone conducting information and the fact that they're mixed for – the sound is typically mixed for speakers and direct to reflected energy ratios, it's very hard to know what flat really is. Mm. Steve, what do you what do you say about this whole issue of flat frequency response? Well, here's uh, something we we referred to before: the ultimate ears personal reference monitor. Which the only reason to buy it is because you don't want flat. So the thing is, they have another headphone called the uh, UE reference monitor, which is, according to UE, subjectively flat. And I have both headphones, so I went to the uh, the UE dealer in New York, and I sat and I diddled the controls and came up with a pleasing uh, setting for this headphone that sounds good with audiophile recordings that I know I was present at some of the sessions for Chesky, and I played a wide range of commercial recordings that I know well, and I kept basically togging back and forth between those two, you know, correcting the, the settings of the controls so that I could still have the audiophile recordings sound good to my ear. And, and have the commercial recording sound good and eventually came up with an EQ setting that I find pleasing with a wide range of music and that setting is far from flat. So flat is a ni nice idea as a concept in terms of what people would actually enjoy listening to. I really don't think most people would enjoy flat. Mm. It's <clears throat> this reminds me of a discussion we had a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember exactly which episode it was, but we were trying to relate uh, audio me uh, calibration uh. with video with video calibration. Now, video calibration is very clear cut. Uh, Absolutely. You, you know, you you specify the color temperature of the grayscale and mm -hmm. where the color points are, and the closer you can get to that as a measured standard. The, the better the picture really looks uh, and the more accurate it is to the director's intent. With audio, but, it's, it's a much f fuzzier thing. I'm sorry, Steve, you were going to say something? I was going to say, see, the beauty of uh, the video reviewer's job is that everyone in a dark room without lots of reflective surfaces sees the exact same thing. But with audio, you'll never hear the exact same thing. There's too, Why way is that? too many both variables. Why is that? You're, say you have two people in the room, you're still in the same room either – well, so with speakers, oh, you're still in the same room or with headphones, you, you've got them on your, yourself. What, what, what's going to be so different as opposed to watching video? Because of all those other variables of what you're plugging the headphones into, the recordings themselves are far from flat, the ambient noise level, your preferences for bass, how – is it? there's too many other variables. There's no variables with video in a dark room. Everyone sees the exact same thing. Mm. Of course, if it's a light room and there's all sorts of other stuff going on, you won't see the same thing. But at least everyone has the ability when they turn out the lights, if there's not a lot of reflective surfaces near a TV, to see the same exact calibrated picture no matter what. To the ability of the TV to reproduce an accurate picture, everyone sees the exact same thing. But with rooms... There's all bets are off with speakers. With headphones, it's, there's, there's certainly more control, but the interface between your headphone and your head and everything else in the system, that would also change things. We don't all hear the same thing. You know, I would, I would argue that, uh, like Paul Barton did with speakers, that we're, we likely hear things more closely than um, we would make the assumption. I mean, our, our ears are all our ears are different, but we're all humans. It's not like the difference between a human ear and a dog ear. But I think it goes deeper than that. Uh, Steve and I sat down with David Chesky a few months ago and, and had a talk. And, and one of the things that I was interested in and, and, and I think is is relevant in this part of the discussion is what is the difference between the visual sense and the auditory sense? Um, we have a visual sense um, to 
manipulate objects in the world around us. And it's, it's very, very, uh, discreet and uh, uh, objectifiable. You know, if you take a picture and then you, you sit in the same place and look with that, that picture, it's going to be quite similar. But I think the auditory system is quite a different beast altogether. And uh, it's there uh, and, uh, um, in terms of our evolution as a warning system. It's, it's tuned for certain types of frequencies. It, it, you know, you, you want to be able to hear a stick crack and, and, you know, somebody walking up near you. It's like your early warning system. Um, and it, there's also something about music that's different from um, visual. Uh, if, you, if you take the... The experience of listening to an orchestra as opposed to the experience of looking at a painting, it seems to me that, that the, the sonic, uh, the sound coming to us almost uh, magically appears in our head, that we experience it uh, in, in a wholly different way. It, we experience it from within us and, and that uh, visual, the visual medium, um, you look at it. It's sort of the sound you're in it and the, the visual stuff, you look at it and, and it, it takes it takes a little bit more concentration, at least for me, to um, uh, to to sort of engage with a painting uh, because you still have to overcome the distance between you and it. Whereas sound is, you know, for example, uh, uh, evolutionarily, we, we've evolved to be able to shut our eyes. But we haven't evolved to be able to shut our ears. Um, <laughs> there's, wow, that's there's, great. There's something just completely different about experiencing sound from the the visual sense, and I think it makes it the sound uh, and 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 our ability to understand sound and and uh, qu uh, qualify. I won't say quantify, but qualify sound. I think much more difficult. And um, while, while Steve and I might be able to listen to a pair of headphones and, and, and make some uh, comments about it, I can tell you that those biodynamic T1s for a lot of time were thought to be great headphones on HeadFi. And I think they, there was a lot of uh, groupthink, for example, that went into it. And, and our, our subjective experience of sound is quite a bit more malleable, I think, than our, 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 our experience of vision. So I think that having an objective... A stake in the ground someplace allows us to be a little more um, sensitive and and give us gives us some bearings. Mm, that's a very good mm. point. So this is interesting. I think so. So the the head fires like the T one, many of them in in different ver you know different experiences with different amplifiers listening to different music they liked it, and then yeah. they saw that it didn't measure well, and then the tide turned because now they realized that the sound that they liked was was not perfect or not what they thought it was, and then they decided they didn't like it. Well, I think that's... That's interesting. Well, I think that's an oversimplification to the point <laughs> where, where it really doesn't make sense because, of course, there were, <clears throat> there were both camps all the way along. Okay, I, right. I think it sort of boiled down to unsophisticated listeners have just mm -hmm. as loud a voice as sophisticated listeners do. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, okay. And so it's a little bit easy for the... For, um, hype to occur where mm -hmm. a, a reader can't figure it out. But if a reader hears the two sides and then mm -hmm. looks at the measurements to go, well, you know, there's really something going on here. So. Okay. So here's my I have to say, question. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. So, you know, there, there's an audio riddle that I've heard for decades and I'd never heard a, a good answer to this riddle, but we can throw it out there to the, to the, to the viewers and uh, listeners and see what they think. So if you're walking down the street in a, in a city and you hear the sound of an acoustic guitar coming out of an apartment window on the third floor, you or a piano or someone singing, you instantly know that's a real guitar. That's someone actually singing. That's someone playing a piano. Now, of course, if you heard the sound of an or orchestra coming out of a window, you'd know it's not real because it's kind of unlikely that there's an orchestra inside a Brooklyn apartment. But so you use the voice guitar or piano, an actual sound that could be real or could be a recording. And yet when you hear it, you instantly know that's the real thing. And all the ways that we measure and analyze sound quality with frequency response and impulse testing and all of those things in imaging have nothing to do with that experience. And yet 
the human brain can hear that and, and, and instantly know that that's real. Actually, and that's, Steve, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I uh, Finish your thought, but I have something. I have a response to that. Go ahead. Oh, good. Uh, no, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, I, I want to give you a counterexample. And I, I said – I told this story last week, and I'll tell it again because it's very relevant right now. Okay. Uh, at, a stere- at a stereophile show, much like the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, which is, was held in a hotel you know, here in L.A. In, many years ago, before I worked for stereophile or, or home theater or any of those companies, I, uh, I, w- I went to the show. I went to the stereophile show, and I walked around the hotel, and I walked past this one room. And I heard some music coming out of it, as I did all the others. And I remember so clearly my first thought, which was, what are they doing with live musicians in there? Uh-huh, now, remember, uh-huh. I'm a professional musician. Uh-huh. So I might have even more sensitivity to what you're talking about than, than okay. the average person. Uh-huh. My first thought was, what are they doing with live musicians in there? Well, they didn't uh-huh. have live musicians in ah. there. It was, the, it was the Wilson Audio Room. Uh-huh. And they were playing, you know, some some acoustic jazz, probably, which okay. uh, obviously if it had been an orchestra, I'd have sort of known, OK, they All can't right, fit right, an orchestra right. in a hotel room. But, but you know, a, a quartet or a trio, uh-huh. mm-hmm. I, I immediately I was fooled. My brain was fooled into thinking there was live musicians in there. And it only took a second to realize there weren't. I looked in the room and it was full of people and there were these speakers. And I went, oh, wow, that was really weird. Oh. So I. I just give you the example, a counterexample oh, but, of. But Scott, you're you're playing into my uh, my hand here. <laughs> oh yeah, how's that? Yeah, because that proves that yes, a hi-fi can reproduce a sound so well that it could fool you, a musician, that it's real. So then the question is to go back from that and say, is the Wilson speaker such a particularly great measuring speaker that it could fool the human ear into thinking that re- reproducing music, reproduce music is actually live music? Because, yeah, that's a perfect example of what, what would distinguish a great hi-fi from a merely good hi-fi, one that right. can fool the ear. But measurements, making it measure better, I don't recall that Wilson speakers are spectacular measuring speakers by high-end speaker standards. But yet they had that something that can't be measured that fooled your ear. That, that sort of proves my point, that measurements that, have nothing to do with it. Well... I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we go on... You, you before we go on, me. Thank you, Scott. I, you know, I, 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 all I can do is report my own experiences. <laughs> oh, that's um, perfect. Uh, <laughs> before we go on, and I know there's a lot more to cover, we don't have that much more time, but I do want to take a moment before we continue to thank our uh, sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Now, of course, everyone listening here probably already knows that Netflix offers thousands of TV episodes and movies that can be streamed directly to your TV or your game console or your Blu-ray player or your iPhone or uh, Android phone, even some Windows phones, as I understand it, your tablet, uh, even your computer, to to be so 20th century about it. Uh, but any, just about any consumer electronics device these days has a Netflix app that lets you stream just about any content you want, certainly anything that's available there, which is thousands of episodes and and movies, directly to your TV or your smartphone or any other display in your house or on the go even. You You can even start on one device and finish on another. So it's the ultimate inconvenience. And all you can consume as much as you want. You can watch as much as you want for uh, one low monthly fee, totally unlimited, only by your bandwidth cap, I suppose. But that's not Netflix's uh, issue. That is your cable provider's, your uh, internet provider's issue. And uh, in any event, you can even try it for 30 days free. All you have to do is go to netflix.com slash twit and sign up for your 30-day free trial. Be sure to use that URL. It's netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit network. So uh, there was a question I wanted to ask you guys, and it is this. We're talking about measurements, objective measurements versus subjective experience. And Steve, you mentioned earlier that uh, you were talking to at least one headphone manufacturer, and probably most of them, if not all of them, do this too. They do a lot of measuring, but they also end up tuning it to a subjective impression. Right. Now, there are measurements and there are measurements. And the manufacturer measurements 
I always view with a great deal of skepticism. In fact, one, one reason I like review measurements, such as Tile does, is to compare those, which I trust because I know how Tile does it. He's got some very expensive equipment and he really knows what he's doing. Uh, and I do this with video too. I, uh, I, I compare the measurements that are made in a review with the measurements that the manufacturer provides in their marketing material, which may or may not, in fact, be the measurements that actually the engineers used. But the marketing material, obviously, they want it to look as good as possible. Of course. Yeah. What do you What do you think about that, Steve? I would certainly trust uh, Tile's measurements over any manufacturer's measurements, <laughs> but I would, be skeptical. I would be skeptical of both in terms of learning anything that would would guide me to the you know to to buy something in either case. Mm -hmm. I have to. Uh, Tile, I have to yeah, I have to say, Scott. Um, first of all, that there really is it's, it's a very odd trend, but because because it is so difficult. Um, uh, but there, because I think of the more and more measurements that have gotten out there, that manufacturers are are feeling brave enough to put actual measurements on their boxes, and I've begun to see that more and more. And I've had a couple headphones come in here where, when I measured them, it looked very, very close to what was on the box. So it's beginning to change a little in part because there's so many people doing measurements. The, the big problem with measurements and headphone measurements um, as it exists in, in today is that uh, you, it's very difficult to compare measurements from one source with measurements from another source because uh, small differences make, uh, make a, a big difference in terms of the way the me measurements show up. And, and that's one of the reasons why I try to measure as many headphones as I can because uh, measurements really are only good relative to each other on this using the same methods and equipment. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm not surprised to see some differences on the boxes, but I but I, I can tell you that more and more there are real measurements on the boxes. Hmm, cool. F loop yeah. in the chat room. F loop in the chat room is asking. How important are low distortion measurements in headphones? At RMA, RMAF, the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, a V-Moda engineer indicated that the M100s were, quote, not particularly low distortion, and that the distortion profile was actually part of the sound they were going for. Mm. Well, I can tell Ta you, because I just measured the M100s today, which I'm wearing, and um, they were not particularly low distortion measurements, although there wasn't any one particular place in the in the response where it, the distortion uh, measurement peaked. So, yeah, they they aren't particularly low, although I wouldn't call them high, but they they aren't certainly not the best I've seen. Uh there's a couple of answers to that question. One is in the low frequencies, uh, you get a, um, a lot of distortion on open air headphones because the driver can't keep compressing the sound for long periods of time. So if you have a, a big, long, low frequency wavelength that can't really compress the sound in the shape of a sine wave. And as a consequence, you have a, a rise in distortion in the low frequencies very, very often with headphones. And um, I don't necessarily think that uh, it's terribly detrimental to the sound when that happens. So it, it's not too, uh, you can hear it, it makes the bass sound not quite as tight, but um, there's to some extent no way around it, especially with open headphones. Um, but it's certainly clear um, uh, I've had headphones that have, you know, peaks in their distortion measurement and there's clearly problems at that particular frequency and that you can hear ringing artifacts and stuff going on near that frequency. So, um, uh, so distortion measurements are informative, but um, I wouldn't say any, mm, any more terribly informative than other things. Uh, other than um, uh, I've had a uh, headphone that, it appears it's got some problems with it in manufacturing quality recently. And I've seen a couple of samples, uh, five samples of this product. I'm not going to talk about it right now because I'm waiting on, for a little while um, until I get some manufacturers' responses to things. But um, it's the distortion measurements that made it obvious that these headphones were not acting properly and they weren't acting the same from one to the next. And so mm. they – they can they they can tell you when things are wrong, but again, they're they're not really going to tell you when things are right or when they're pleasant. 
<laughs> yeah. Steve, what do you think about uh, distortion measurements? Did, did you hear the, the V-Moda M100s? Did you like them? Yes, actually. I'm reviewing them as well. And I do like mm-hmm. them a lot. I really do. Uh, it's funny and, because I'm also comparing the, the M100s to the Sennheiser Momentum, which is about the same price. And one other, oh, the um, Biodynamic Pro 1 Custom. Custom Pro, Custom One Pro headphone, which is significantly cheaper. And it's interesting how those three sort of line up and play games in terms of bass, how much bass has, how, they, how open they sound. They're all, I like them all for different reasons. I would recommend at this point all three highly and possibly the Biodynamic the most because it's $100 less than the other two. But, hmm. uh, yeah, I think when I start to notice distortion in headphones, it's 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 pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, it's, it must be pretty fuzzy. But you know, I do want to talk about um, the thing about accuracy and measurements. I, I had a piece that ran in Stereophiles uh, as we see it column last month. It was called "Accuracy is Not the Answer," and I wrote it because all you know when we're talking about differences in headphones and measurements and stuff, we're talking about relatively tiny differences between A and B. So for this for this uh, column that I wrote, I was talking about the transi- transition from the LP era to the CD era. And that before I heard a, my very first CD, I assumed that it was going to be a giant breakthrough in sound quality. We were going from a format LP that has fr- a frequency response of most phono cartridges, looks like a mountain range, to uh, CD's frequency response that looks perfectly flat. You could literally draw with a ruler. It doesn't have any irregularities at all. Uh, I remember remember when CDs came out, they were called perfect sound forever. Right. And and, and LPs have speed, uh, you know, uh, variability problems. They have noise problems. There's a million things that happen in an LP that deviate deviate from perfect and we were going to a format cd that in all of those ways was essentially perfect and because it was this giant difference i expected when i played a first my first cd that was well recorded that i would be so much closer to hearing the sound of real instruments and human voices but what i heard was that it just sounded different i'm not going to be i'm not bashing digital i'm not anti-digital i'm just saying that even when you go from something that's hot, has huge uh, inaccuracies as part of the format, vinyl, to one that has essentially none, that doesn't get you there. That doesn't suddenly make the musicians appear between your speakers. So when we're going back to measuring headphones and speakers, those differences are, between well-designed products, relatively small. So again, I'm, I'm back to that the measurements... It, are not useful in predicting which one you, the buyer, would actually prefer. Tile, what do you think about the wide difference in measurements between LP and CD? Well, uh, uh, well, I have to say that I'm a bit of a mystic <laughs> in the way I think about things. That's, that's why I noticed that we don't have ear lids to shut our ears, see? Ah. You'd think it was obvious, but... Um, it's a very good point. I, I do believe that we are far more sensitive in ways that we may not even be able to describe to the world around us. And I... I so I... I I think there are things that we there are things about sound that we experience that causes us to um, uh, feel very differently about it. I, uh, there was a, I, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> One time I was painting a room and there was a boom box two rooms away down the hallway playing Muddy Waters. And I was sitting there painting and it was latex paint. So this wasn't the paint fumes getting to me, but I was totally getting into the music and the reproduction quality of the music was about zero. It was all reflected <laughs> sound and it was coming from a boom box and it didn't matter. Uh, one time I sat around a table with a whole bunch of writers from uh, one of the audio websites and I asked the question, um, is the art of music and the appreciation of the art of music uh, 
directly related to the quality of the fidelity of the music. And everybody said no. So, you know, our ability to appreciate things, our ability to experience or have an experience um, is just as much controlled by our own feelings as it is what it is we're objectively hearing. And and there are likely a lot of things about vinyl that, you know, the continuity of the signal and God only knows what, but that is somehow accessible to us and or or, or sensible to us. Attractive so, in many respects. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I spent the other I, – I built one of the bottlehead cracks the other day, which is a funky little tube amplifier. And, you know, it's got a very high amplifier. output. In, yeah, it's a great little amplifier. And, um, you know, it, it has a lot of distortion in it, you know. And um, I listened to it with my HD600s and it was one of the nicest, most pleasing uh, um, uh, – uh, music listening times I've had in a long time. Now, was it the second order distortion of the amplifier? Was it the fact that I had built it? But you know, <laughs> when you, good point. Yeah, yeah, those things I think are all relevant. So uh, that's why I say this domain of the experience is completely different than the domain of objective measurement. I will go back to say something though that. Uh, Steve said that there aren't a lot of differences in measurements, and here's the here's a, a measurement of a Grado. Well, this is a Sennheiser HD8. Uh, sorry, this is an Odyssey LCD three square wave, and this is a Grado square wave. And um, you can see they're dramatically different. And and they there are people that like Grado headphones, and there are people that don't. And and when I see a curve like that, I know I don't like it. So uh, I think it is possible to... And, 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 sorry, sorry, uh, Kyle. So, so when you see a curve like that uh, and then you listen to those headphones, are you fairly certain that you're, you're not going to like the sound of those headphones? <laughs> uh, yes. There you go. <laughs> see? <laughs> There's a point a I... Self, maybe a self-fulfilling prophecy, sure. Maybe. There, there is a point I wanted to make about the difference between audio and or audible and visual experience. Tyle, you were talking about that a little earlier, and there was a point that I really wanted to make, which was, I've thought about that a lot too. I think your point about how we don't have ear lids, we, we can close our eyes and shut out the visual world completely, but we can't do that with, with ears. Another interesting thing that I've always wondered about is that the human auditory system is sensitive to, theoretically, 10 octaves of information from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz the human visual system is sensitive to one octave of of light frequencies basically from uh well i forget what the frequencies are the wavelengths are about 400 something to about 700 something yeah, so and there's a difference one, in dynamic range as well right also yes exactly right um dynamic range in hearing is about 130 db um I can't remember what it is visually. Maybe somebody in the chat room will, will know. Certainly if I doc Mark is in there, he'll know. Um, but in any event, there are great differences between the processing, the perception and processing of video, visual information uh, as opposed to audible information. And I think your comments about that are fascinating. And I just wanted to add that little piece. Yeah. There's a great book called Spatial Hearing by Jens Blauert. It's called spatial hearing, and it's it's sort of a a, a uh, compendium of the state of the art of psychoacoustics, and um, it's a fascinating book. It, there are so many things that are just amazing about the way we hear. For example, people can go uh, partially deaf in one ear through a, a catastrophic event like a loud sound or something like that, and mm -hmm. um, they can suffer uh, permanent hearing loss of some type. And um, immediately, their ability to localize sound uh, gets very much poorer. But within three weeks, they will regain about ninety percent of their ability mm. to localize sound. Wow! Wow! And it's because it's because the brain compensates. So, uh, Steve 
uh, told me about this experiment once where you listen, he listened to a sound and then you listened to another sound and right, then they right, played right. the first sound back and it sounded different because it had been preconditioned by the second sound. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the perceptive system is so malleable and, and, uh, it, it's, it, 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 it means that the objectivity is, is, uh, not the whole story and can't ever be the whole story. Well, that's a fascinating point that that uh, your experience, your previous experience in in the past, can affect what you're experiencing now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'll I'll give you another one. Uh, I worked for Headroom uh, for a lot of years, and um, uh, early on, there were a lot of people that we sold headphones to that only had heard one headphone previously. So they had only had one headphone that they'd been listening to. So they would call for our advice. We'd give them some advice. We'd send the headphones off to them. And they would, after receiving the headphones, oftentimes call back and say, these headphones suck. And then yeah. we would say, well, you have a 30-day satisfaction guarantee. Spend some time with those headphones. Don't listen to your headphones. And then nearing the end of that 30 days, go back and listen to your old headphones. And almost... Every time that ever happened, they would call back and go, oh, you're right. These headphones are much better than my old headphones. But they wouldn't know that right off the bat. Hmm. You know, Scott, I can part, give you – I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say sorry. in part in part, the reason for that is headphone listening is also completely unnatural. And that's another thing to take into account here is that – Good point. Head, Headphone listening is not it is nowhere near a natural way to hear something, and it it's one of the things that makes he, uh, headphone evaluation so hard, is because you you've got to have long long years of experience actually listening to headphones. Your experience listening to speakers really isn't transferable to headphones because, for whatever there's a number of technical reasons, but you know I think there's a perceptual reasons as well. They're just it's a different thing. Steve, what were you going to say? Uh, well, actually, referring to what, what um, Tyle just said, you know, I noticed when I started reviewing headphones that when I went from A headphone to B headphone, uh, mm -hmm. the B headphone would always sound worse than the A headphone yep. because I had accommodated to the A headphone. That was the normal. And then when I went to the second headphone, it was different and not the same as A so it didn't right. sound correct anymore, you know? Right. And then if I would reverse it and play B first and then switch to A, then I wouldn't like A. So, so it's a matter of accommodation. That was the word I was looking exactly. for, accommodation. Accommodation, right. And, and yeah. I would exactly. say that that's another reason why it's good to have measurements around because they, <laughs> you, you don't accommodate. It's, there's no accommodation. Right, right, right. So it, it becomes, if you're able to interpret them, it becomes a, a baseline. So if somebody says this headphone is is has more bass than that headphone, and I measure it, and it, it obviously doesn't, it's very easy to go. Well, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so it has this ability to put a stake in the ground. But I will I will agree with Steve wholeheartedly that you cannot pick the best headphone for you by using the measurements, and and you can't even say. Uh, beyond some course evaluation, you can't even say what that experience is going to be like unless you listen to them. So, Tyler, I have a question. Yeah. So if one, if one of your readers said, I uh, listen exclusively to classical music and I want uh -huh. to spend up to $1,000 on headphones, uh -huh. the headphone that you would recommend to that person, uh, to the next guy who says, I have up to $1,000 to spend on headphones, but I only listen to rock music, would you recommend the same headphone? Absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. Very well. <laughs> the defense rests. <laughs> All right. Listen, guys, we're, we're out of time here. I do have one final question that was actually posed by A. Barron in the chat room, which is, what headphones do you grab just for pure listening? Ty, let's start with you. <laughs> Uh, and and, and you just indicated that it, it, depending on what you're listening to, it might be a different set of headphones. That's uh, headphones are very application specific. Yes. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> yes, Steve. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve has a scoreboard in his office or somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, my 
favorite headphone to listen to is probably either the Sennheiser HD 800 or the Odyssey LCD 3. Or the Jerry Harvey. Actually, I'll take it all back and say probably the Jerry Harvey 13 if I feel like putting something in my ears. Mm. Very, very good. Now, the uh, Odysseys, uh, I believe you said at the beginning of the show, didn't measure very well. No, they, they, they well, in, in some regards, they don't. But neither do the Sennheisers. In some regards, they don't measure well either. They're too bright, and they don't have good bass response. There At you least go. they don't have as good bass response as the Odysseys. And, okay. and my personal listening preference is that a little bit rolled off on top and a little bit extra bass on the bottom. There you go. Steve, how about you? Well, I actually, I also use uh, JH13s as one of my main headphones. But, you know, for a long time, I mean, I listen to so many headphones all the time, I, I tend to grab the one that I'm reviewing when I'm going out. But I was listening to the Velodyne V-Pulse in-ear headphone. It's an $80 universal fit headphone, and there was just something about it. It's not a audiophile headphone, but for some reason... I kept going back to that to listen to while I was on the subway. It has way too much bass when you're in a quiet room, but just the right amount of bass on the New York City subway. At home, I actually have two old headphones that I've had for a long time that are sort of my standard ones when I'm not reviewing headphones. It's funny because they're so opposite. The Sennheiser HD 580 and a Grado RS1. Yeah. And now, just one last uh, part of this question is, what is the price range of the of your favorite headphones, Steve, in terms of the Grados and the Sennheisers? Wh wh what kind of price range are we talking about? Um, well, the Grado is about $700. The Sennheiser was, it's, it's long discontinued, or it's not, it's discontinued. It was probably around $2, 250 the, Vel the, Ve the Velodyne I referred to is $80 or $90, and the JH13s are $1,100. Tile, how about you? So what kind of price spread. ranges? That is quite a spread. Tile, what about you? Uh, well, of course, the, the LCD threes are two grand, and the and the uh, HD eight hundreds are fourteen hundred dollars. Uh, I personally think that um, I personally think that there really shouldn't be any headphones over about five hundred dollars. I really think they should be able to make a pair of headphones for five hundred dollars that that can do anything you want to do, but. That's just not the reality. That's just my <laughs> wish. You think F that Odyssey could make that headphone, that exact headphone, for, and somehow sell it for $500? No, but I think Sony could. Oh, okay. So, But they wouldn't. F-Loop -Loop in yeah. the chat room is saying that J JPS Labs previewed the, some headphones at uh, Rocky Mountain for five grand, Yeah, and certainly the stacks are in that same range. Yeah, the 009 uh, is, is, and it's glorious sounding. I have to say, I listened to the 007 and was totally blown away myself. Well, listen, you guys, we're, we're over time, and I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, to Tom Merritt and uh, Framerate for that, but I do want to thank both my guests for a fascinating discussion. Tyle Hertzens from innerfidelity.com and Steve Guttenberg from CNET uh, Audio, Audiophiliac blog. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for being here today and for a very stimulating debate. You're welcome, Thanks. Scott. Thank you. So uh, you can you can catch uh, Tile's work and Steve too sometimes at interfidelity.com. Uh, Steve's blog is at uh, news.cnet.com/audiophiliac. Uh, my my uh, email is scott at twit.tv. So you can send me questions or suggestions for future guests or anything else you'd like to to express. Uh, I'm answering questions now on secrets of home theater and high fidelity, which is hometheaterhifi.com. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Peter Lingdorf, the brains behind the amazing sounding and amazingly expensive Steindor, uh, Steinway Lingdorf speakers, uh, which I've heard uh, in a couple of venues, and they are quite remarkable. He's also got some really fascinating room correction uh, technology that we're going to be talking about next week. So I do hope you will join me then. Until then, geek out. <laughs>